Hello and welcome to episode 54 of Radicals in Conversation, the monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. I'm your host, Chris Brown. Firstly, it's great to be back in the studio. It's been a couple of months since our last episode aired. That one was with Sir Haima Manzor Khan, author of Tangled in Terror. If you haven't already listened to it, then you definitely should go back and do so. Since then, we've launched a new series through the podcast, Radicals and Conversation In-House. These are episodes recorded at Bookhouse in Bristol, in the southwest of England. Bookhouse is a fantastic new independent bookshop with an impressive events programme, and we're really excited here at Pluto to be partnering with them to share some of these events' conversations with you via the podcast. Last month, episode one featured Stacey Clare, author of The Ethical Stripper, in conversation with Amelie from the Bristol Sex Workers Collective. Later this month, we'll be sharing episode two with Asfar Shafi and Ilias Nagdi in conversation about their new book, Race to the Bottom. So stay tuned for that. But to return our focus now to our regular show and an episode that has been in the diary for a while, so I'm pleased to be able to share it with you all at last. I'm joined today by Francoise Vergez, author of A Feminist Theory of Violence and a Decolonial Feminism. Francoise is also joined on the panel by Avia Sarah Day, and Shanice Octavia McBean, who are the co-authors of the forthcoming book, Abolition Revolution, that's out from Pluto in November. Our discussion today is all about carceral feminism, racial capitalism, and the structural violence of the state. We also talk about abolitionist politics and formulating alternative approaches to questions of protection and justice that reject the logic and infrastructure of carcerality. So without further ado, here are Francoise Vergez, Avia Sarah Day and Shanice Octavia McBean on Radicals in Conversation. It's my real pleasure to be here with all of you on this call today. Um, for listeners, we're joined today by Francoise Vergez, the author of A Feminist Theory of Violence, A Decolonial Perspective. Uh, Francoise is also the author of A Decolonial Feminism, which was published by Pluto last April in 2021. And we're also on the call with Avia Sarah Day and Shanice Octavia McBean, who are the co-authors of the forthcoming book, Abolition Revolution. That's also going to be out from Pluto in November. And uh, people can pre-order it right now. It's on the website, plutobooks.com. So after listening to this, everyone should go and check out both of those books. And podcast listeners can, as ever, get 50% 50% off. They just need to use the coupon podcast at the checkout. So that's the quick sell at the beginning. Um, but yeah, let's let's dive in. So Francoise, we'll start with you. Your new book is out now. It's a feminist theory of violence. Um, Angela Davis praised it as being a robust decolonial challenge to carceral feminism. Uh, and as I say, your previous book came out with Pluto last April, and that was a decolonial feminism. So could you start by telling us just very briefly what the main thesis of a decolonial feminism was and then what new ground you're kind of exploring with this new book? Uh, the thesis in, in so many words of a decolonial feminism was that you cannot have feminism without anti-racism, anti-capitalism and anti-imperialism and a project of decolonization that is not finished, you know, of uh, abolition revolution to uh, borrow from Aria and Shanice. That was the thesis. And looking at the way in which other feminism exists and to betray that revolutionary objective. So to look also at the more recent objective of white bourgeois feminism and uh, female nationalism, but also a form of imperialism in feminism, especially their contribution to Islamophobia, uh, their role in pushing for Islamophobia in Europe, and uh, also to continue to uh, still to adopt a colonial civilizing mission uh, look uh, and a practice towards other women in the world, especially in the global south. So that was a decolonial feminism. And it was also the question that for me, it's very essential who cleaned the world and who has been cleaning the world for a century and has been always a rationalized work and exploited, and of course, look at as a devaluated. So that was, you know, uh, the, the basis. Looking at the woman fabricated as the most vulnerable uh, by racial capitalism, and saying that their struggle are really from which we should look, you know, that these struggles are for me the most important struggle. 
but we could also talk about indigenous women fighting for the right of land. I mean, my point was look at those who are fabricated by racial capitalism as the most vulnerable to premature deaths, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore said. So that was that. Then it followed up, I mean, uh, theory for feminists of violence, in fact, follow up in that questioning in that uh, looking at the way in which even the emergence of Me Too in certain circles, also the denunciation of violence led to a demand for more state protection, for more prison, for more punishment, that, you know, carceral feminism, and looking at it and see, you know, where it's coming from, what are its objectives, how it is a racist uh, objective, and uh, does not question at all the structure of the state and the structure of systemic violence, does not look also as violence as directed against people, against animal plants and lands and sea and water and rivers, but look at it as if, you know, men being bad, I mean, the nature of men, men as a biological category against women. And erasing the story of uh, systemic violence uh, through slave trade, uh, slavery, colonialism, and imperialism today. And the last thing I was uh, raising was uh, we do need protection and we have to reappropriate protection, the politic of protection, that we don't leave to the state and that we reappropriate through self-defense, but also form of anti-racist protection. Uh, how to protect our community, how to organize uh, refuge, uh, sanctuaries to uh, protect people and perhaps uh, our community. And tech protection, which has been so much captured by the state and by carceral feminism and the far right, and has been used to further imperialism and capitalism, and to take it back and to say we will have our own form of protection. It's, of course, in the genealogy of all forms of self-defense uh, by uh, enslave and colonize and, and indigenous people. It's within that genealogy. Hmm. Yeah, no, thanks. That's a really good overview. And there's a lot in there that we'll be coming on to talk about, you know, the idea of alternative approaches to the idea of protection outside of the state. You know, there's a, a lot there to discuss. Um, you touched on it already there. There was one passage that I thought was really clarifying in the book about neoliberalism sort of valorizing the idea of the efficient body, you know, being that of a white man in full possession of physical strength, you know, who goes jogging, eats organic food, etc., you know, works for economic success. But this is all predicated on the work of racialized bodies. And that kind of really stuck with me, this idea of the link, I suppose, between racism and capitalism. Yeah, exactly. You know, I was absolutely struck by this uh, celebration of the healthy body, doing jogging, eating healthy food, uh, even, you know, getting up quite early in the morning, going back at quite late at night, that performing body, that's incredible performing body, performance outsource work, uh, not saying no to work even on Saturday and Sunday, and presenting that as heroic, fantastic, and in fact, rest on the exploitation of so many people, especially black and racialized women, but also, you know, the global source. I mean, all what make the life of the white man and the white woman comfortable and possible, and even what they show as effort and sacrifice is in fact possible because there is a sacrifice for so many body. You know, what I call this economy of exhaustion, that healthy body is made possible because of the exhausted body. It's the woman who clean, you know, the meditation room or the yoga room or, you know, the office and also the people in the global source who cultivate things and feed these people. I mean, all the black and racialized women who take care of the kids, of the elderly, of these bourgeois women and men made that possible. So, yes, I mean, it, there is an organization of health, even a vision of health, of the healthy body, which is historical, it's not just emerged in the 20th and 21st century, and historically based on the exhaustion of mining, if we could say, the life force of black and racialized uh, women and men. Absolutely, you know. So this effectively has if the healthy body has a double, and that double is effectively the person who's exhausted. I was really struck by when I was talking with cleaning women about the fact that they were quite often talking about the exhaustion, mm. you know, the long hour of transportation, the work, which is extremely difficult and heavy, and then going back, their exhausted body, and the shortened life 
because of all this life and work, mm. whereas the white body can enjoy a long life, uh, which was exacerbated by the pandemic that we saw it even you know more clearly. I mean, we, some of us anyway, saw it even more clearly during the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and again, you'd mentioned right at the beginning that Ruth Wilson Gilmore definition of racism as the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And this idea of vulnerability is something that is produced and then put upon certain people, you know, racialized people, um, rather than being something that's inherent to certain groups. I thought that's a really important idea or concept because we often think of vulnerability as this innate characteristic, but actually it's something that's produced by capital, by the state. Yeah. Exactly. We know that, you know, life expectancy is much shorter for black community and also racialized community and people in the global south. And we saw it again during the pandemic where the death was, was greater, you know, among uh, black community and community of color. That was very clear. But even if we see every day, you know, the else question, uh, that we do see that more people are dying of air pollution in the global south than from any other cause. And so we do see a production by racial capitalism of an uninhabitable world, you know, unbreathable world for so many people. It's really a concrete question. It's not a metaphor. It's not something. It's not an image. It's concrete condition of zone of non-being, to borrow from that expression from Franz Fanon. And it's multiplying with the climate disaster produced by racial capitalism again, and also by imperialism. So yes, I mean, there is a production of an uninhabitable world, of an unbreathable world, uh, by imperialist war, by racism, by, you know, sexism, by exploitation, by extraction. Mm. And it has nothing to do with some kind of, a, you know, mysterious condition. It's really a fabrication. Yes, absolutely. Mm. To follow on, I guess, like there's something that comes through clearly in your book as well, how the racist states, politics of protection, and, you know, this is something I want us to talk about, requires like the making of distinctions between those who have the right to protection and those who don't. I think you give three examples in the book that look at the multiplication of sort of measures and laws and so on that are aimed at the protection of women and children, uh, but against the backdrop of increasing precarity and vulnerability and violence against women and children outside of these enclaves, I guess. I think there's there's one where you talk about, is it Berkeley maybe? Um, and there's a couple of other examples. Yes, I mean, for the question of children, I was really struck because as you see, the multiplication of law, but not only a law of reflection, books, you know, even progress in terms of psychological, you know, children, psychology, incredible data and knowledge. And in the meantime, Billion of children not allowed to have a childhood. They cannot have a childhood. What is called childhood? The protection of childhood. The fact that you you know that you can live effectively between your birth and let's say fifteen year old. You have a right to a certain childhood, to innocence, to play, to development. You know toys and that matter books, traveling, going to museum. This is really just for. Small, small, small number of children in the world. The mass of children is absolutely deprived of that, but not deprived because, again, you know, some mysterious condition, they do not have a right to childhood. And then also we do see it through the criminalization of black children, Palestinian children, children of color, who are treated as adult who are put in jail, even, you know, if they are 12, 14, who are, you know, treated as adults. So we do see that even the conception of childhood, of the, those who have the right to protection, is absolutely not universal, is racialized, class, effectively. And, of course, within that, uh, you will look also at trans, uh, gay, you know, kids and kids forced to sex work or choosing sex work. All this, effectively, uh, you have those who have the right to protection, those who are effectively deserve even protection, who lives matter, to use that expression, and those who lives do not matter, and who would be even accused, and when their parents would be accused of not taking care, this is not a good family, not the good mother, the good father. So that division date back from slavery, where men were forbidden to become father, and women were forbidden to become mother, and children were not children. So that division remains with us today. 
through the criminalization, again, as I say, but also through the fact that children of color know that they do not have access to the world or to the space, the public space, as a white children. I live in Paris, and you would know if you're not working for some delivery company, there are neighborhoods you do not enter as a black or, you know, uh, Arab uh, young man or young woman, a veiled young woman. You do not circulate freely. There is not freedom of circulation. So all these so-called universal rights of circulation, of protection, are not told. They have never been for a century. I mean, really, slave trade and slavery operated, you know, what uh, so many people have called, you know, a division within humanity. And so the protection follow that, you know, the protection that touch upon the question of health, the question of uh, the education, who has a right to education. And you do see, I mean, children of the white bourgeoisie, they have, the, they have access to so many things to uh, cultivate their imagination, to cultivate their skills, to be able to say, yes, you could become whatever you want. And giving them that idea that it rests on their singular qualities. And of course, I'm not saying they don't have qualities, but it tries also because so many other children do not have this right. That access is made possible upon the fact that so many will not have that access. It's absolutely embedded in racial capitalism. Hmm. One thing that comes through very strongly in your book and, and indeed in Abolition Revolution is the idea that the state is not only sort of incapable of actually genuinely protecting people who are you know, vulnerable, um, but it's a perpetrator of violence itself. I was wondering if perhaps someone would like to unpack that idea a little bit. Um, I know, Avira and Shanice, in your book, you talk about the political journey of Sisters Uncut from the group's early days, you know, responding to austerity and cuts to, you know, domestic violence service funding towards a sort of more abolitionist orientation today. But, you know, that Alongside that, there's this idea that, yeah, the state is actually a perpetrator of violence. Structurally, violence is not just this interpersonal thing. Yeah, could you maybe say a little bit more about that idea and why it's important to recognise? I suppose, yeah, like Sisters Uncut has been around for quite a few years now. And that has meant that within the collective, within the organisation, that's like quite a good opportunity to reflect on the last sort of, what has it been now, eight years not just in terms of Sisters Uncut, but the movement and understanding our relationship to the state and like how much things have changed. But I guess, you know, when we started out, a lot of us were working in the domestic violence sector or service users of the of the domestic violence sector or sometimes a bit of a combination of both or had been. And yeah, we'd sort of grown up with this idea of the sort of welfare state and like Coming up through the sort of anti-austerity movement, a lot of the emphasis was, you know, we're entitled to the resources of the state and we should be fighting to access it. And over time, we came to understand things quite differently. And I think we were kind of a product of our time in a sense, because we were somewhat disconnected from sort of global revolutionary movements of, of the past, even though we had like sort of limited understanding of that that kind of had different kinds of critiques of the state and, and the position of the state and the relationship of the state to the movement. But we eventually, and it was, you know, through organising, through our work, like our jobs, came to see things really, really differently as domestic violence services were gutted, as resources were taken away. It wasn't necessarily the case that, you know, that money just evaporated and disappeared like we sort of expected. We saw that money kind of rerouted towards policing, you know, the home office and suddenly the domestic violence services that we thought all of them were just going to close actually managed to stay open by applying for funding from the police or from the home office. And that was on the understanding that those domestic violence services would do some of the state's bidding do the bidding of the police so you know work in partnership with the police to see more people get arrested work in partnership with the home office even if that meant that partnership would leave you know migrant women vulnerable to being deported 
And so, you know, in order to survive, you saw like a lot of domestic violence services going down that route of having a partnership, you know, their their funding basically reliant on a, some kind of partnership with that much more securitized like side of the state or the, the policing wing of the state. And the impact of that has been enormous. We've seen huge numbers of women being arrested, as I said, vulnerable to deportation, getting getting detained and deported. And these are, you know, women, a lot of them survivors who, you know, these domestic violence services were purportedly there to protect and support. But in this kind of relationship with the state, the state is is kind of, you know, obviously only defining violence in terms of an individual man usually, but not always, you know, perpetrating violence towards an individual woman is kind of like the stereotype, the archetype there, and won't include the violence of police officers, whether that's the violence of arresting a survivor and putting her in a police cell overnight, separating her from her baby or or children, the violence of of strip search, like we've seen with Child Q, a young black child who was strip searched by police in her school. Like these kinds of things, when, you know, the state is funding domestic violence services, these kinds of things don't get defined as violence, but they're obviously experienced as violence by the people who have had to go through those experiences when they've come up against the state. And so, yeah, like initially, like when when we started Sisters Uncut, we kind of had that kind of understanding of the state as, well, the state gives funding. It's the welfare state that we were trying to access But we didn't necessarily have that deep understanding of power and the relationship between the state and us as organisers, but also in terms of the wider movement against violence and how implicated the state is in that violence and how it is essentially the root of that violence. You know, the state perpetrates the violence that filters down to our communities. It sets the standard through which power operates and, and kind of takes place and and so our organising is quite an interesting arc in terms of how our understanding of that developed. And now, you know, obviously we're organising as a proudly abolitionist collective that, you know, is not invested in those kind of state based responses to violence because the state, you know, as you, as you said there, Chris, is a perpetrator, is the perpetrator. Yeah, no, thanks, Avia. That's definitely true. And I think one thing that maybe it would be good to talk about now is this idea of carceral feminism, right? It's something that comes up in both books. And I think it's really important to unpack what that means a little bit in terms of how it relates to questions of the state and, and women and you know people more generally, because uh, it does have a bearing on everything you've just been saying. I think what's interesting about carceral feminism is the way it, which it acts as a proxy or an ideology for justifying the violent functions of the state in general. So I like to think of it as opposed to being a kind of bottom-up version of feminism, it's very much a kind of top-down version of feminism and plays quite an interesting ideological role in propping up these systems of violence. You saw that around Sarah Everard, for example, when Sarah Everard was murdered, the response from the state was to boost its own uh, mechanisms for violence on the streets and violence in detention centres and violence in prisons, despite the fact that Sarah Everard was murdered by a man who was a police officer. What I think is interesting about the critique of carceral feminism and what it represents is, I think, a shift from this concept of intersectionality, which, let's say, really gained popularity in the UK, particularly in universities around kind of, you know, the 2007 to 2010 period, which was very much about categorizing individual experiences and demands for recognition. And as the kind of state has had to radicalize its violence against us, I think we've seen grassroots feminism radicalizing in terms of its analysis of violence. And so we've moved from this category of intersectionality to a critique now of imperialism and racial capitalism. And I think that's the context in which we get this burgeoning abolitionist movement, which is about looking at fundamental society restructure and in many ways holds the like kernel for like a revolutionary 
politics for the 21st century, as opposed to, I guess, a politics of, of recognition. So I think the breakdown of the idea of the state as a protector and instead a recognition of the state as a perpetrator is part of the breakdown of the ideological mechanisms that the state has used up until now to protect its violence, but which are now faltering. And I think that's why we're getting crisis after crisis after crisis, particularly in the UK. You know, we had the Black Lives Matter movement and literally six months later, we had the crisis around Sarah Everard, had the crisis around other women who were killed by men on the streets, you know. And then after that, we had the Kill the Bill movement and the resignation of Cressida Dick. And I think all this is coming from the breakdown of the ideological mechanisms such as carceral feminism that the state uses to to perpetrate and protect its violence? Well, uh, I mean, I want to begin to say that I read uh, Shanice and Aria book, and I think it's a really a fantastic book, and it's very important, especially also what Aria say of how you learn uh, and you, you move uh, and how this experience of activism, of learning, you know, and learning and learning is a very important uh, lesson for all of us, uh, you know, in activism. Again, about, you know, carceral feminism, I absolutely agree, you know, with just what Shani say. I will just perhaps add that there is really also today, we see it on the global scene, Again, you know, what a certain feminism, the role that a certain feminism play in maintaining imperialism on the global scale, you know, how it's being an accomplice to that. But it's also, for me, again, historical. There is a feminism that has always been accomplice to the state, absolutely complicit with what the state is doing. And it's really now that the state is in crisis and the West is in crisis and everywhere you have all this crisis is becoming important. Women's rights have become a very important tool, ideological tool in the end of uh, capitalism and neoliberalism and imperialism. Uh, West state intervene everywhere, you know, arm intervention to save women, as they say. So we do see also in the 21st century how women's, as women, I mean, the way the state conceive women and to wish a certain feminism uh, not only support but provide vocabulary is again, you know, a fight, I mean, a counter, a revolution to what, what has been described of incredible growth, you know, from the grass up. No, representation is no longer enough and in fact was a trap, has been a trap and we are moving towards abolitionist politics today. Because there is something, you know, that there was example about the UK, but we do see also in France. And in France, you have a very strong state feminism, absolutely state feminism. And now you have a prime minister with a woman and the leader of the National Assembly, the president of the, is a woman. So suddenly we are, you know, all this is presented as progress for women. And all this behind that is neoliberal politics, is racial capitalism, is imperialism. So there is effectively, and I absolutely agree with that, that it's the moment of going beyond this representation politics. There is a form of neoliberal anti-racism. There is a, an understanding that why not, you know, okay, do you want people, you know, in power who are like black or, you know, racialized or people, we will do it. That's no problem. We will, you know, do these things. We will put them on TV. We will put them in film. And with this is because there is a form, of, there is a possibility of, appropriating anti-racism to further uh, neoliberal politics. So we have not only effectively abolitionism, but a political anti-racism, that our struggle against racism is not just a struggle of representation, but a struggle of liberation, deep liberation, radical liberation. And carceral feminism contribute to effectively confuse or, you know, trouble all this by, by again, focusing on the individual to punish, a vocabulary of against, you know, just victim that the state, the police, the tribunal, you know, all these institutions, which are institutions of repression and structural violence, will protect us. In a moment, when if we look at Europe, where refugees are absolutely treated as you know subhuman people, uh, or there is a distinction with refugees, as we saw recently, you know those who can be refugees 
and those who cannot be a refugee. So we see, again, a constant production of who deserve to be protected, who deserve to be uh, uh, welcome, who deserve to receive, you know, all of the good education and those. But this is more and more clearer, and I agree, because you do have more and more movement now, and we are just at an incredible renewal of political movement, politics in the sense of fighting for liberation and abolition, and not just effectively for representation, which, of course, has been criticized, but neoliberalism presented nonetheless as, you know, well, we will give you that. And what Shani said about intersectionality becoming almost like a fetish, you know, like something you said it as if something will change, and not attacking the structure constantly that produce uh, this uh, inequality and justice, it's again a trap. And we see more and more uh, movement and collective being clearer about that, more and more writing, challenging this, and going back to the roots of oppression and exploitation. Yeah, thanks, Francoise. So, yeah, maybe let's let's move the discussion on a little bit to talking about an anti-racist decolonial feminism and the fact that it, it is kind of at odds with carcerality and at odds with the existence of prisons. What can we kind of turn to if we're trying to move beyond a uh, carceral justice system? When we're talking about abolitionism, what other yeah, examples are there out there in the world, either, you know, fictional from literature or from like things that have been practiced in the past or in the present, you know, on some scale that offer an alternative vision of justice? I think the first question for me is always in whose interests and for what purpose does a system exist? And I think the way in which we have become confused about the purpose of the state is by thinking it exists to serve ordinary people. When in fact, from its very inception, if you look at the formation of the Metropolitan Police in 1829, it was formed to protect the interests of the ruling class at a time of deep political, social uh, and economic crisis. So when it comes to thinking about alternatives to carceral systems, what it's really about is grounding our answers and solutions in the interests of ordinary and working class people. It's about our starting place being, what do we need to survive? What do our bodies need to thrive? What do we need to be mentally well? And replacing what we have with those things that ordinary working class people need to survive and thrive. And so, you know, there are examples of even within the structures that exist now within capitalist society, we can see the way in which approaching the question of harm, not from the the question of, all right, well, how do we throw more people in prison and how do we incarcerate more people? But from from the starting point being, what do people need? we actually get results. So one of the examples that we talk about in the book, and it is a problematic example for lots of reasons, is the public health approach to knife and knife crime and youth violence in, 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 in Scotland, whereby they offered people who were potentially at risk of uh, you know, engaging in youth violence or being victims of knife crime, alternative routes out, which included mental health support, housing, employment, training and they actually saw a reduction in the numbers of youth violence and knife crime and then there's also of course historical examples that we can turn to as well so the Black Panther Party initially began its strategy as very combative you know kind of brawling street brawls with the police and the state and quite quickly in the early 70s shifted to a community program based on rebuilding community infrastructure that had been decimated in black communities. So that included breakfast programs and school programs and political education. And I think the connection between, again, what we need as ordinary people to thrive and abolition is is crystal clear because abolition is a project of, you know, sometimes a little bit... Um, the term abolition gives a disservice to the project because yes, we are trying to get rid of harmful carceral institutions, but actually what we're trying to do is replace those with things that work for us as ordinary people. 
I wanted to um, just add to that a little bit because I think one of the things that people like get quite um, confused about with this question of like, well, what do we have instead is, you know, a lot of us, it's quite hard to imagine a world without a criminal justice system, without that kind of system dealing with a lot of our problems. But, you know, fundamentally, it doesn't deal with a lot of our problems anyway. It's not actually geared towards addressing sexual violence, addressing domestic violence. It has really, really, really low, you know, clear up rates. It's fundamentally about, you know, as she used to say, in protecting power. Like those on the margins of society have always understood that. And many of us actually, you know, when we've got a problem, if our cousin, you know, nicked something from us, would the first place we would go be the police? Would we call 111 or 999, whatever it is, be the first recourse in that situation? You'd probably go to someone in your family, in your, in, in your community to kind of figure out a way to address that and get get your stuff back before involving the state. And I guess the question of like, well, what would it look like to be able to resource that instinct within us to come at our problems in our family, in our, you know, in our wider community without that kind of like impulse to get state punitive responses involved? Would it, what would it mean to resource that? And it feels kind of a bit pie in the sky sometimes because, you know, we're all working so hard and that's like that the appeal of a criminal justice system is that it outsources the problem of our community for someone else to deal with because we don't have the time and the energy to deal with perpetrators of domestic violence in our community or when this person who is poor nicks something from someone we don't have the time to to build the kind you know that's what it feels like but there are really really great examples where you know, the state has, has absented itself and people have stepped in. In the days after Grenfell Tower, you know, basically burnt and, and, you know, so many people lost their lives. The state basically, it was actually a shocking amount of time before, you know, state representatives actually came onto that estate and offered anything in terms of crisis management or disaster response because, you know, they panicked. They were completely implicated in that fire and knew that and were off somewhere probably burning or shredding the evidence of that. And in the absence of the state, it was people in that community that stepped up. It was the people in that community that took in survivors, that organised the food, that organised the clothing, organised the housing and, and the support. And even a local statistician stepped in to start counting the missing and try to gather the data to kind of like understand what had happened. The community self-organised, the state absented itself. And so I suppose in terms of this question of, well, what would it mean to have a system outside of the criminal justice system dealing with our problems? We are able to self-organise that and to meet our own needs. You know, when we hit those crisis points and when we, we're pushed to the absolute limit when we have to, then... You know, I think we see that we can do it and that we're good at it and that we don't waste our time doing stuff that we don't need. We focus on the things that are absolutely necessary, the housing, the food, all of that stuff. And so what would it mean to get all of our resources and everything towards that so that it was it was fully resourced and fully supported? And I think asking that question, that's when you get to start to feel that it is possible that we could build up communities in such a way to deal with the harm that happens in our communities ourselves. That, you know, starting for what people need is extremely important. And also this, uh, the way in which people show their capacity to intervene and to be able to act. We saw it also during the pandemic in France, in a neighborhood totally abandoned by the state, young people started to organize to go, you know, do the shopping and bring back, you know, whatever, food and medicine to people who could not leave their apartment. So we do see that capacity of organizing and of, um, yes, of uh, self-determination constantly. And we do see how the state fear that, is effectively afraid every time that possibility and capacity re-emerge and are visible. And in Europe, I mean, in France, and I suppose it was in the UK, for instance, we try then to criminalize some of this form of solidarity. We saw it 
especially towards refugee, where the French state started to criminalize, you know, self-organizing and a form of where you start by what people need and you act from that, you know. And the way in which the state will answer is like some form of organization that do not effectively take into account at all the needs of the people, but what is seen as what are the needs. And usually, I mean, this conception is to protect order and what is called, you know, state order. I would say uh, constantly starting from below, from what people need, and show the capacity, and to um, constantly expand them and protect them also from the attack of the state. That's one level. I would say another level is uh, what used to be called, you know, political education. That is extremely needed to also counter the fact that uh, there is arm to what do I do? I mean, to explain to present this capacity to show, you know, how it's possible that people uh, exchange that. We saw that also during, you know, the, the yellow jacket in front, that, that movement. Another level, I would say, it's like, you know, the, we have also to constantly to attack private property. Private property is at the root of carceral ideology, to protect property and uh, to uh, multiply the question of, you know, common uh, property, common sharing, I constantly show that most of the state intervention with the police and the tribunal is to protect private property. And private property has effectively as its roots in uh, slavery and against working people and against the poor people. So to show that, the last uh, perhaps things I will say about that also is to show that, I mean, that council feminism, the way in which the state step in constantly is in fact, rather than bringing protection, is constantly bringing conflict and tension. And what people will want, you know, is peacefulness. So how do we also multiply the space where people can meet Arrest, you know, have, have, a, have a laugh, uh, eat together. I mean, far more effectively, this sharing of social moment that are absolutely essential for human being, and that the state constantly forbid by repressing social gathering, public gathering, because it's making noise, or you know, there is a possibility of crime, or and so we see how the state multiply the impossibility, I mean, try to produce this impossibility of connection to then to say that by isolating each of us, to say then we will step up to protect you. So what people need, what Shanice and Navaya were saying, you know, is to start from that housing, uh, you know, uh, training, care for each other is absolutely essential toward this construction of against the state, what I call the state of permanent war, that the state is leading a permanent war against the poor, the working class, the people. And how then we have also to, within that question of protection and the example that were given, we are bringing a form of revolutionary peace, if I, if I may say, of saying, no, there is a possibility that we don't live in constant uh, conflictual, uh, you know, this conflictual way that is produced by this constant tension, by the presence of the police uh, constantly in the public space, by the call, you know, for police protection is in fact a constant image and practice of violence. Even the presence of the constant presence of police in the street is violence, is a production of systemic violence. And that peacefulness can be produced differently. And as the example was saying, you know, providing housing and so on, the level of violence uh, fell. And that is constantly proven. Or effectively, the example of the Black Panther Party with breakfast, this is much more important than effectively walking around. So how providing uh, what people need and listening to what they need is the answer, is a form of alternative justice. Justice is not just about, you know, this person is right, this person is wrong, and how do you right the wrong? Justice is about if also the, the daily life, having a possibility of a daily life in which I do not have constantly to be anxious, you know, stress out, uh, wondering how I can, you know, find food or, or medicine or care. Or, this is part of, uh, in fact, justice. Yeah, I'll just chip in that I think that 
question of private property and the ability to live a life and a life that's not just survival but the ability to be happy and to thrive is is a really important conversation because one of the ways in which the state manufactures consent to violence against working class people despite the fact that working class people are the main recipients of that violence is by manufacturing precariety and vulnerability and disinvestment from working class life and our ability to survive and thrive. And for ordinary people, that then creates a pull factor towards protecting your private property and protecting your possessions and protecting your interests as an individual. And so opening out that idea of daily justice, you know, life justice, where we have the things that we need to not just survive and thrive, is part and parcel of breaking down, I guess, the power and hegemony of the state and its carceral systems by offering alternatives in the form of communal living and social justice and, you know, the ability to not just survive and thrive, yeah, breaks down that pull factor towards private property and individualism that carceral systems depend on. Yeah, I just, like, wanted to add on that because at the end of um, your book, Francois, the thing that really uh, touched me a lot and kind of like got to a lot of, you know, it articulated my own politics in a really, really important way around your discussion around like, is it non-violence? Is it violence? And that fundamentally, it's everything has to be on the table, all kinds of organizing, this diversity of organizing to get there, to reach that, it, you know, has to be on the table and fundamentally we're going to have to back up those who are on the margins those people who have the least to lose in forging through that new system that new way of life and like just kind of coming back from what Shanice was just saying that you know the more bought into the system we are the more we've kind of accepted the kind of trinkets of like neoliberalism or social mobility or representation you know, the harder it is going to be for a lot of those people to kind of like disinvest from that and to think about that radical politics. But fundamentally, you know, often when you have these big radical explosions, when you have uprisings, it comes from those people with the least to lose and the most to gain from taking that kind of action. And so, yeah, I fundamentally really like loved the way you finished the book, Francoise, and kind of like highlighting that and bringing our minds back to that fact and, I, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, we all need to be invested in building that infrastructure so that those spontaneous moments, those uprisings are held and, and actually forge through into the kind of systems that we're all talking about today. What kind of like network of a refuge and sanctuary we will have to build today? Spaces where we go and uh, we find care, but we find also perhaps sometimes uh, being alone, you know, like I, have, I need a, a time to be by myself, but also books, you know, like that a library can be a, a sanctuary, a bookstore, a, a restaurant, um, a place where to, to sew, a place where to, to prepare things. How do we build, you know, different social space and encounter that also provide uh, for people who are exhausted and push to deep distress by the incredible systemic violence of racial capitalism, which is day and night, constantly, you know, like practically, you know, really, as I say, this uninhabitable world. So how do we think about this space that have history, I mean, that we find example in history, that also uh, provide this moment of or, uh, perhaps also to recoup, okay, now what do we do? How do we do? What did people do over there? Uh, I remember a conversation with someone working in the township uh, of uh, South Africa today, not, you know, during apartheid, and uh, having, like, no access to land and housing, and having, you know, this expression, how we will humanize the world, because the world has not been humanized. The world is still not humanized. That was for them the terrain, the starting point of struggle, of fighting in incredible deprivation in the township of Cape Town, of effectively 
finding a way for themselves. So they had open a university, for instance, where, you know, they were reading and thinking. They were also singing together. I mean, all really in a space totally abandoned by the post-supported state of finding a way of humanizing uh, the world. And that expression, when he would he talk about that, and unfortunately, he has been um, recently assassinated by a thug of the state, and that expression, humanizing the world, made me made me think a lot at the time, you know, when it uh, struck something and I say, okay, yes, what we will need today, not in this or in the future, but today, to make this space of uh, humanizing. And so it goes back to also what you describe in your book of, uh, okay, th- this sometime day by day uh, creation of this uh, space and moment in which, uh, again, there is hope, there is uh, trust in the fact that, yes, there will be evolution. We are fighting for evolution. Hmm. Thanks, Francoise. I mean, I'm mindful of the time here, so maybe we'll try and wrap up with one last sort of question from me, which is a follow-on from what you've been saying there. Is there anything, I suppose, that's been in the news recently that's resonated with any of you uh, relating to the you know themes of our conversation today? Uh, maybe because it chimes with the critiques we've been making around racial capitalism, state violence, or because it speaks to this idea of, you know, transformational justice. And I suppose as a follow-on question, are there any actions or organising that's going on now that you would like to give a shout out to, to make our listeners aware of, maybe just so that they can find out more or to get involved? It's very difficult to think of one thing for me, Mm. because um, I feel we are surrounded by... uh, the attack on uh, the working class and community, uh, indigenous community, is we do observe an incredible counter-revolution. So uh, my interest is like to see how this counter-revolution expresses itself in different ways, perhaps in Brazil under Bolsonaro, or you know, in India under Modi, or in UK uh, with uh, you know Boris Johnson, or the one who will follow up, or in France with Macron and how we can see what nonetheless connect all these people, who are nonetheless, you know, not the same, I'm not t- talking about sameness, but what connect them, you know, and what connect them is a, absolutely the refusal to humanize the world, the absolute refusal to, you know, like a backup and maintain a system of extraction, exploitation, dispossession, racism. And the rising in Europe of uh, the far right, of fascism. I don't want to enter the discussion, is it the same fascism or whatever. There is a form of fascism today. And the far right entering parliament everywhere. So what's happening as a form of, you know, uh, countering this counter-revolution is an incredible multiplication of collectives, of uh, books. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that there is a rethinking of, from what we should call defeat. I mean, some defeat that we have, but not defeat in the Western military meaning, uh, but defeat because of this incredible, you know, counter-revolution machine. And from that, I think there is what I will say, what is for me the action and organization that matter and give me incredible hope is that. It's this incredible uh, collective thinking and organizing and practice that we do see all over the, the world with the deep consciousness that abolition is effectively the objective, the way to go. And this is, for me, one of the most radical things happening today. It shows in many different ways. It shows in film, it shows in poetry, in literature, in organizing, in effectively even trial that indigenous people or other communities are doing against the state to stop certain abuse uh, without necessarily, you know, without guarantee, but doing it. What I do say is every day, every day, everywhere, there is organizing this incredible for me uh, movement uh, locally and also globally that provides so many sources and references and uh, in which we do see the contour of the possibility of other way of being together, yes. I don't want to underestimate uh, the capacity of destruction of uh, our enemy. And I do see that uh, starting from 
what people need, what people say, will be the most important form of, of fighting back against uh, that machine of destruction. So I cannot sit one action, one form of organization, but I'm absolutely in admiration of this uh, spirit, this local and global spirit of finding a way to humanize the world. Mm. Thanks, Francoise. Any final words from you, Shanice or Revere, before we end? Yeah, I was just um, thinking about that question of, you know, what's going on at the moment and here in Britain, like, you know, Boris Johnson, our prime minister, has just resigned. And, you know, I think it's really interesting that of all the things that brought his downfall, it was the question of response around sexual violence. And, you know, the state has had a really terrible year on that front, you know, after Sarah Everard. It's been story after story after story of police implication and perpetration of sexual violence, of murder, of generalised gendered violence. And this is meant to be the institution that protects women from violence. And, you know, the kind of the curtains come down and, and everyone's starting to, to see and understand. And I think, you know, we're living in an interesting time where, you know, as Francoise was saying that, you know, the capitalist class doesn't really seem to have a whole lot to offer. It's extracted all that can be extracted from the planet. And the answer seems to just be more police, more prisons to control the population, you know, that has needs to survive in this, you know, cost of living crisis, fuel crisis, all of that. It doesn't seem to have anything to offer. And what's quite interesting is there's been many, many, many years of anti-racist organising and what we're seeing as a result of the sort of understanding of the police as, as, a, as a perpetrator, as we've been talking about, is that actually lots of white women are starting to feel that this is not an institution that is going to protect me. This is an institution that is a danger to me and joining in the struggle in an anti-racist struggle against violence, whether that's racist violence or gendered violence. And the state just doesn't seem to have anything to offer you know, at one point was offering white people a better system and it all seems to be crumbling because there's not much, you know, materially to offer there. And so, yeah, I think it's really interesting to experience. It's kind of bewildering and frightening and scary to see crisis after crisis after crisis. But also I feel very optimistic about the organising that's happening as a response and the solidarities that are emerging as a response, you know, out of the organising against the police crime sentencing and courts bill is seeing solidarity between black communities, between gypsy Roma traveller communities, between women, groups of people that never organised before and are continuing to build those relationships of solidarity. I think in terms of the groups that we need to be invested in, I think that we're going to have a hell of a fight on our hands. And I think one of the thrusts of our book was we have to confront the violent state as it is. It's been built up in such a way as to prevent us from being able to access all the things that we need, the food, the land, the housing, all of that. You know, that is where the investment in policing, in prisons comes from. And so it's not going to happen easily and they're not going to go down without a fight. And so whether or not you're joining your trade union, your tenants union, whatever that is, there is going to have to be some kind of reckoning or building up of our skills and our resistance to be able to confront that to be able to access the land that we need to survive to get the housing to get everything that we want for a dignified life and for one in which we can survive and thrive we organize in sitters uncut we also organize an organization called cop watch which is focused on resisting the violent state but yeah whether you're joining a union tenant union whatever that is i think fundamentally you know, abolitionist politics has to be central to that. We're never going to see a revolution without confronting the violence of the state in that sense. Yeah, thanks, Avir. Shanice, anything from you or should we end it there? I agree with everything that both Francois and Avir have said. So yeah, nothing to add. Fantastic. Thanks so much for taking the time. I'm really glad we got to do this and it was a great discussion. So thank you all very much. 
That was Francoise Vergès, Avia Sarah Day, and Shanice Octavia McBean on Radicals in Conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, then don't forget to like, share, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can find A Feminist Theory of Violence, A Decolonial Feminism, and Abolition Revolution, all available on plutobooks.com. Podcast listeners get 50% off, as ever. Just use the coupon PODCAST at the checkout. We'll be back later this month with another Radicals in Conversation in-house, and then back again in August with our regular show. So until then, thanks very much for listening, and goodbye. Goodbye.